the, the uh, winter night dinner at five o'clock tonight, but because the, our latest blast of winter is not quite over yet, it was decided that we will have it as a luncheon. So, head on across the, the hallway here, right after church, because we will have lunch, and then we'll have the DVD after that. No, no DVD. This Thursday will be the mobile food truck distribution. Now, see this is included in your bulletin, and it's got to do with flowers for Easter. Today's your last chance. If you want to order flowers for Easter, it's got to do it today because the order's got to go in on the first. Okay, Easter season services are coming up, and they are listed in your bulletin. So you can uh, look it up and find out when the various times, various Easter services are. Thank you. Yeah, no DVD. We're postponing the DVD part. We're not staying for that. We'll let you get right home after lunch while you still can. Those folks up on the hill, Gary's got to put that snowblower back on the tractor. He's got to get back home. <laughs> yes. I haven't lived here that long, but I figured out winter uh, still comes along in April. And it's not even April yet, so it has come along. Uh, we're going to pray uh, uh, for the needs that we have. Uh, remember Sue? She's in... Uh, the hospital in Florida, hoping to get out soon, but keep praying for her recovery. Barb Crandall is in the hospital in Erie, keep praying for her situation and uh, for doctor's wisdom for her. And there's many other needs on this list that we today will take to the Lord. So let's pray. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so M Mrs. Hamilton, pastor's wife at Stockton Community Church, so remember her in prayer as well. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your touch, for your power, for your strength. We thank you for the ability you have to minister to us, whether it be our bodies that have need or our spirits that have need. Whatever need we have, we are confident and we have great assurance from the scripture that when we bring our, our requests, our needs, our burdens before you, you are a God who is able and capable of ministering to us. We find a list of folks, many with various physical afflictions, some who we know quite well, members of our church family, others whom we may recognize the name that's on the list, and others who somebody here knows quite well, but most of us might not know whom they are. But that isn't your situation. You, our God, know all of these folks. You know all of their needs. You know all of the, the burdens that they have, the situations that they face. You know those who are dealing with cancer. You know those who are dealing with long-term needs. You know the needs of recent injuries like Mrs. Hamilton or uh, the needs to recover from surgery like Sue and Barb. You know the needs of those who are dealing with uh, any kind of physical affliction, and you also know the needs of those who are dealing with other situations spiritually, those who are today in, in true need of wisdom or direction and guidance, not knowing what to do, those who are in need of uh, your touch to be upon them to, to give them spiritual strength, perhaps burdened by temptation or sin, uh, those who today need your wisdom, and those today who need your encouragement, your strengthening, your courage and your, your provision to help them overcome things that they're going through in life. Whatever our need, you understand in the most intimate way what we need, and you understand in the most intimate way the best answer. So we lay before you today all of these needs. We turn them over to your hand, to your power, to your strength. We look to you to minister to the needs of individual people. We look to you to minister the needs of our country in general and the spiritual needs of America. For the needs of this world we live in, the dangerous and sinful place that it is, we pray that you would meet those needs. We pray for your provision for our missionaries as they serve around this world, that they might have opportunity to share the truth. 
We pray today for the needs that are, are exemplified in our hearts in a, in a quiet or silent way, a, a thing or a need or a provision that's in our life today that is just desperately needed but not able to be listed. And you know of those as well. So we pray that in all these things that you might minister to us, in all these things we might be encouraged by you, in all these things there would be healing, hope, and help that is provided from the hand of a Savior who today loves us so much and cares for us that we can bring all these things before you. And we certainly ask them all in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. I'll be reading Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. We're going to try children's chat again. We did it briefly in December. And now we'll try it one more time if the kids want to come forward this morning before we dismiss for our three to seven year old children's church. I have a lesson for you this morning. Yep, come right up, grab a seat. We're going to show you some, something interesting, something you're familiar with. It's colors. Everybody knows about colors, right? All right. So here's a couple colors that we understand today that have meaning. What do you think these two colors like this mean? Yes. Boil water? Well, I, maybe, but that wasn't quite what I was thinking of. Pink and blue. What do pink and blue stand for today? Boys? Girls. Ah, oh, we're catching on. We've given, as our society, our culture, we've assigned us guys, like it or not, blue. Guys, you're blue. Girls? You're represented by pink, isn't it? How about that? Well, in Bible times, colors meant things. Not blue and pink for boys and girls, I don't think. But in Bible times, this color meant something. What did this color... This, this is going to be... If you can answer this, you will go to the top of your class. Maybe some of them can answer. What does this color purple mean in the Bible? Boys and... Boys and... That's a good try. Really good try. Not right, but it was a great try. You get an A for effort. Uh, if it's not boys and girls, what do we think it means? Family? Uh, good try again. That's not it. One more try here. Girls? No. Purple meant wealthy, rich, or a king. Because in Bible times, the color purple, as far as clothing, was difficult to actually produce. And it cost a ton of money to make purple clothing. So if you wore purple, you were the sign of wealth and riches. Looking around here, uh, I, I see one over there wearing purple. Uh, <laughs> not many of us even wear purple today, apparently. Purple was a sign of wealth in, the, in New Testament times. And it was reflected in the Bible when you saw a lady like Lydia who, who made purple clothing. She made wealthy clothing. Uh, in the, this isn't so much in the Bible, but we... Uh, Think of it this way. What does this color mean to us about a Bible thing? Sin. You are right. Sin. A dark heart, a black heart. And that's kind of light and darkness from the Bible, where light is godly and dark is sin. Somebody's got you well trained about this color. All right. Sin. Evil. Evil or sin, yes. Exactly. So we get that out of the Bible. Now, well, this one's interesting because it does mean a couple things in the Bible. But very often, this means what? This is going to be a little tricky. We're going to let the let you have a chance. 
What? The blood. It could be the blood of Jesus, but it also means something else. Love. Well, in the Bible, red and love don't quite match. No, that, that didn't happen in the Bible. We think of it like that, but because we have we put a big heart on it, and it's Valentine's Day. Um, that's our that's our culture, not the Bible. They didn't have Valentine's. Well, let me put it together with this color. What's this color mean in the Bible? Oh, we got all you you were first. What's this color mean in the Bible, Silas? Wash away our sins. Now, if you look at the two of these together, there's a verse that includes both of these. Let me, he, oh, he's, he, he may have it. It's in Isaiah. It says, uh, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet. What color is scarlet? Scarlet is red. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And of course, wool is white. And so that verse in the Bible talks about this is our sin. It's red like scarlet. But when Jesus Christ purifies us through his red blood, we become white as snow. In other words, all the sin, whether you use the the black or the scarlet, the red, all of this in Jesus becomes this. White like snow. There's a lesson on a snowy March morning for you to remember. Jesus takes this, makes it this. You can head off to junior church this morning or back to your seat if you're older than junior church. And I'll take my colors with me. Hide them away. Somewhere. All right. And we are in Colossians this morning. Back to Colossians. Chapter 3, a new chapter. We're going to talk about the first four verses that George read this morning. It's a short passage, but there's a, a lot of stuff in this passage. Years ago when I lived in Grafton, I was working at a state park. And I do remember the time of year was early spring. Now, there's a place on a 1,500-foot mountain that was just east of Troy, New York. The spring didn't come quickly to Grafton Mountain. Uh, so I remember it was cold. It was early season. There wasn't much life. And uh, there was a crew of about three of us who were working on something. I really don't remember what we were doing, but we were working on something. And all of a sudden, we heard the sound of jet engines. And in all honesty, jet engines back then going over were not that strange. Uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s when I worked at the park, Plattsburgh Air Force Base, just up the Champlain, was open, as was Griffiths Air Force Base in Rome, New York, on the other side of the Adirondacks. So our military did training exercises over the Adirondacks all the time. To hear fast-moving jets flying over, many of them very high up, but you could still hear them, was hardly unusual back then. We, we just got used to it that the military did a lot of training over the Adirondacks because they had two bases that were literally right there. But this was different. It was a different noise. It was unusual. And so as you hear it, you look up. And when we looked up, the only time I've ever seen this, there was a very low for military jets, a very low large jet with its umbilical cord refueling a smaller jet. Now, that was very unusual. Obviously, there was no need to refuel that close to Griffiths or to uh, Plattsburgh, but it was obviously a training mission where they were training on, on the refueling of jets. And we watched them. They just lumbered across the sky. Usually, those military flights just flew. But this just lumbered across the sky, and we looked at it, and we all just, you know, that's interesting, and we watched it go and head off to the horizon. But it was the odd noise and then the very odd appearance that we looked up. I'm going to guess that had not that happened, none of us would have stood there, as much as state workers liked to avoid work at time, we did not stood there looking up, waiting for something to fly over us. And I still remember that. I try to forget many of those days at the, at the state park and have succeeded mostly. But I remember that event. And I don't remember much else about that day or about that period of time, but I remember watching that. Sometimes we need a passage to remind us of where some of our vision should be. And in spiritual things, the passage we look at today talks about this question. 
not for a refueling jet, but on a spiritual level, are you looking up? And that's all this passage refers to as looking up. And as you dig through this passage, there are three things in this passage that you can measure whether you are looking up spiritually to the Lord. Uh, if you start with verse 1, it very specifically says these verses are for those of us who are believers. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ. It could also say, or since you have been risen with Christ. Since or because you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If I were to bring my pieces of paper back out, since you know that your crimson and black sin have through Christ been washed away, and you are white as snow, if that is you, this passage is for you. If you are risen with Christ, if you have died with Christ, been buried with Him in His death burial, and then live in His resurrection, then seek those things which are above. For those who are not believers, if you've never personally accepted Christ as Savior, believe the gospel message, this passage doesn't apply to you. You cannot do what this passage talks about as far as looking up. There is only one thing you need to do to look up, and that is to look up to Him for salvation, for forgiveness, for accepting that you are still in your crimson, blackened sin, still accountable for it without forgiveness before God, and you need to look up for salvation. But for those who've looked up for salvation, then there are three things that we need to look up to God for in our lives. And the first is, look up to Him regarding daily living. Verse 1 talks about this. So if you're in Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Since you're a believer, look up for the things that you need in life today. The action phrase or word from verse 1 is seek. Uh, seeking is a present tense that also indicates that you're going to continue to do it. It's not just like salvation. How many times if you don't have Christ do you look up to trust Him for salvation? You look up to trust Him for salvation once. One time is all it takes with a sincere heart to look to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you as my Savior. You alone died for me. But this isn't the same as that one time seeking and finding Christ. This is continuing to daily seek the things that are above. Jesus put it this way when he talked in the Beatitudes. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's a continued pattern of seeking to look above to what God can do for your provision. And what provisions do we need in life? And how do we get them? And how do we look up for them? Well, this probably by itself could be one message in a whole, but we're not going to do that. But I'll throw these out there, just look at them later perhaps. What do we seek and look above for every day, and how do we do it? Well, one is prayer. Every time you pray, you are looking where? Hopefully, up. I hope you're not praying to humans. You know, I hope you're not asking somebody else instead of God to do something for you and to minister to you. We ought to be looking ultimately to Him who is above. So prayer is one of the ways in which we daily look up and ask God what we need for Him to do. We also, sometimes as we do that, we look up for wisdom. If any man lacketh wisdom, James says, let him Ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and without reproach. So when we need wisdom or guidance or direction in life, we look up and we see the wisdom of God come down. Anybody ever need power or strength? You just don't have enough strength and power to go today. Maybe temptation is strong or maybe you just feel particularly weak in some way, whether it be in your body or in your soul or in your spirit. We look up for the provisions of difficult times and days. Uh, the things above in this verse, those things which are above, that's the heavenly realm. 
That's where in the picture it says Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. And that's a picture of understanding that came from their context that a king always had at their quote-unquote right hand, their right-hand person, the, the one who was second in charge or second in power. The second most powerful to the throne in earthly terms was at the right hand of the king. And it was a picture they could understand, but it's not an exact picture because Jesus isn't second. He is equal to the Father. The picture kind of breaks down in the heavenly realm. But that is the picture to make us understand the equality of Christ with the Father. When you look to Christ and pray in the name of Jesus, you are really looking to God himself. It says when we pray, we boldly approach him. We, uh, we are able to enter to the throne of God to obtain mercy and help in time of need. And it's the one who's at the right hand who opened the doorway to that throne that we can get in there to ask. And that's looking up. Uh, when we down here need provision, we look up and we say, Lord, and we bring to him the things that we need. And it's amazing because I look at it in my own life. There are times that we don't look up enough or I look up enough. We can get very, very focused not on him and not on things above and not on what he can do for us on a daily basis, but we get very focused on, on solving the problems ourselves and figuring it out ourselves and working our way through it and trying to diagnose it and trying to understand it and trying to come to a good decision and never once look up. Never once think, maybe I should pray about this. Maybe I need help that's beyond my human abilities. Uh, the older we get, the more we understand. We always need help above our human abilities because guess what? Our human abilities are, are very limited. And so the first step to measure whether you are looking up is are you looking up for the, the things that are right in front of you that you truly need? Uh, if, if you can't look up for the crisis that you see coming, probably the next couple of things that these verses list are going to be beyond the thought of what you're doing as you wander through this world. But as a Christian, it would seem to be that the first thing we would look up to and seek the things that are above for are things that affect us today, our life today, our situation today, our hurts, our sorrows, our, our, our difficulties the things that are right before us. When the disciples were with Jesus, they would look up to him, but he was right there with them. What did they have to learn to do after Jesus left? They, they had to look up to him now being where? Not with them, but up there at the right hand of the Father. Quite the adjustment for those disciples. We've never had Jesus right here to look at and look to and say, Jesus, like they had him here. But it's still an adjustment to sometimes put aside the things of earth and look up and say, Lord, I need you. And to seek what he can do for us. The second thing is beyond just what he can do for us and seeking him in our lives. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he'll add things unto us. He'll provide for us. The second thing in verses 2 and 3 is that we look up to Jesus to have a desire for him. It says, verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Set your mind or your heart, which is really the inner real you, and set the affection of that. The action idea here is your mind and your heart, who you really are, set that, put that, Place that, move that inner you to the things that are above, away from the things that are here. And as we do that, what we find is we have an appreciation for what God wants for us and what we want to do for Him. It is very, very easy to get caught up on the things around us, isn't it? How easy is it to get caught up with earthly concerns? Man, they're everywhere. You go to work, 
you, you're filled with a place that has all kinds of earthly concerns. Gary was talking in the adult Sunday school class. He gets to be used as a great example all the time because he just was talking about it, about chair manufacturing and making sure the right part is on a chair uh, because some of them can, in different wood, look alike when you're putting it together, but they're wrong. So you've got to pay attention. I'm not saying, before anybody gets this idea, stop paying attention to what you're doing at work. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying when you decide to go out and drive your car in a little bit of snow, you can just stop paying attention completely and God will take care of you. That's not what I'm saying. This is not a let go and let God thing, you know. Uh, don't let go of the wheel and think God's going to steer your car. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying abandon earth. I'm not saying go out on a field somewhere and wait for the Lord's return. That's not what this passage is saying. But this passage is saying be careful because our affection, our hearts, our minds, the real us can gravitate toward that balance we need as Christians between looking above to deal with the planet we live on to where we completely deal with the planet we live on without looking up. And that becomes the problem. So set your affection, set your heart, set your mind on things above, not on the things of earth. While you are to pay attention to them, we who are Christians understand that we also must look up. We must. You know, Paul was saying that life on this earth and in this world is limited without Christ's involvement if we're a Christian. What are you fond of down here? This is the tough stuff that's hardest to not focus on. I have to be honest. The illustration of Gary's chair loses steam because I'm unfortunately very sure some of the people are only there not because they love turning out great chairs. They're there because at the end of the week they are compensated for their time and effort. And I'm guessing that when they leave on Friday afternoon... The last chair they think of was the last one they saw at the plant, and they're not going to think of another chair till tomorrow morning when they walk back in, begrudgingly going, oh, the weekend was too short. It's not the affection of their heart. It's the job they're assigned, and you should pay attention to the job you're doing for, for someone, but it's probably not the affection of your heart. I can honestly say those years of the state park, it was not the affection of my heart to work at a state park. That was not it. Uh, there was a good reason I was there, and it had to do with the, the check that was paid out by New York State every other week. It wasn't the affection of my heart. The affections of our heart, the things we daydream about. All right, stop daydreaming right now. What were you just daydreaming about? Don't tell me. Don't ask. But the things we daydream about, those are the things that are really the affections of our heart. Some of you might be daydreaming about something you really like. We've promised you lunch here today. Boy, that's a dangerous thing to do because some of us really like food. And, <laughs> and we daydream about it, you know. We, we kind of think about it. It's kind of right, right there to think about. Uh, some of us, maybe it's not food. Maybe it's, uh, you're a sports fan and maybe you're an NCAA sports fan and one of those teams is your team. Or maybe you're a Bills fan and you're already looking to next season. Or some kind of sport. That's what you think about. Some of you might think about and daydream about, if you're particularly young and teenage years, that, that guy or gal you just met. Oh, you know, that's what you think about. Something that's captured a little bit of your heart. I'm guessing there's none of you thinking about that coming medical procedure they're promising. Nope, we, that's not our affection of heart. We're not thinking about that. We're doing everything we can not to think about that until we absolutely have to because that's no affection of our heart. The affections of our heart are the things that are hardest not to think about and occupy all of our time, our effort, and our energy down here. What we truly like down here are the things down here that can steal us away from the affection of of Christ and looking above. And yet, verse 3 says, all of those things are dead. Well, what does that mean? You know, we know Gary's chair is dead. It's not going to come to life. It's not going to walk on its own. Of course, we understand that. What does it mean all these things are dead? It doesn't mean they're bad. It means they're going to die in time limitation. Understand the picture. Everything you have affection for that is purely earthly is going to be passed at some point. It's limited. 
Yes. If your favorite sports team is about to win something, and they do, that will be passed and another season will come. It's just how it is. If, if you are in, infatuated with some earthly thing, like a meal, that will pass quite quickly, won't it? And by uh, dinner time, you'll be thinking about the next one. And by breakfast time, the next one. Because they are limited by time. They pass. All of these earthly things pass. Some of them more slowly than others, but they all will pass. And ultimately, when we are in eternity with the Lord, all of this earth structure and situation that we live in today will be passed. We will look back upon the year 2022, somewhere in eternity, and everything about our lives today, in a certain sense, will be past tense and gone. You young folks, and I'm saying young, 30 and under, are beginning, perhaps, as you get into your 20s, to grapple with this. But when I was in my 20s, it was like, life is forever. You know, I got years of time. Uh, you begin to understand that those years of time begin to get slightly, slightly less as you move through. You get to my age now and you figured it out. There's a lot less time ahead than there has been before. Because for me, just by age, if the Lord doesn't even come in my time, it is likely to all end before earth ends. There is that chance and possibility. And so we begin to understand the limits on time. We begin to understand that those times when... The kids are kids or the grandkids are little are going to end. Guess what happens to all those little kids? They become taller than us. And in my case, most of them did. You know, they, they just, they grow up. And that time, that period, that moment is past. It's dead. It's gone. Now, there's other moments that follow it. But the moments that follow it, they're also going to end. And the moments that follow that. They're also going to end. And the moments that follow that, the same. And on it's going to go. All moments in earthly time end. There will become a moment for if you truly love your job that you retire from it. Because perhaps you can no longer do it. That time frame of your life will come to an end. And some are saying, I don't love my job and I can't wait for that time frame to come to an end. There's a wonderful promise for you. It will come to an end. It's wonderful, isn't it? For those who love their job, not so great. All of these things are time limited. They're dead. They're going to die and pass, and something else is going to come along. That's how earthly life is. And as we approach it that way, remember there's something about eternal life and the life above, looking above, that isn't going to end. It's a permanent state. The hidden life. Verse 3, and your life is hid with Christ in God. We are a part as Christians of a place to come that doesn't have the limitation of earthly time. And I say this because as we look to our lives, we get so involved in the things that are going to end. And we get so caught up with the things that are limited and temporary that at times they can take our attention, our affection, and that's our focus. And somebody might say, when did you focus on the Lord above? And we have a very stumbling answer because we cannot remember when our affection and our heart and our mind really focused on what God is doing in the midst of these periods of earthly time. You see, the merger is not to take the two and separate them, the merger is that in these temporary moments of earthly time, to insert God into them. And as we insert God into our earthly times, our earthly periods as we live this life, we set our affections not just on these things that we should love and aren't bad to love, but we also remember that there's a God above. And His plan interacts with our earthly events. And so that's the second way. We, we desire spiritual things with the affection of our hearts and minds pointed to the Lord, looking above. And the third thing is in verse 4. And this is eternity itself. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. 
we also look above to understand that someday for every Christian, someday for every believer, our time here, being short, being limited, will come to an end. Verse 4 has the idea first that perhaps it could happen that the Lord will come to bring to the air, to bring us up to meet him in the air. The rapture of his church, the taking of his church, uh, described in 1 Thessalonians. And so that's the possibility. And it's a wonderful possibility, except what? 2,000 years later, it hasn't happened yet, has it? You know, I could have swore when I was a new believer, in my, I was a teenager, and I read the passages of Revelation and 1 Thessalonians, I could never really imagine that the Lord might not come in my lifetime. I mean, this world was a mess back then, and it's still a mess now, and I just couldn't envision but what the Lord must come before I ever touch death. But I've lived long enough now to understand that God's time may not see equal to my time. That there might be a real chance that instead of meeting in the air our Savior, I will meet him when this body fails. And there's that real chance. It's happened to everybody so far. You know, uh, everybody who's lived as a Christian, how have they all left up until now, today? They've left by the body failing and, and going into eternity to be with the Lord. There will be a day, as glorious as it is, as wonderful as it will be, when we will appear, he will appear and we'll appear with him in glory. And in life down here will be over. Like that. Amazing, huh? Just as quick as that, earthly concerns, everything, done. And yet, there is also the possibility everybody in this room, even the youngest to the oldest, will live out the complete length of their days if the Lord's plan is to return in the year 22-something. We're not going to make it. It is possible. But what is true is, no matter what way we go, we will go. There's nobody out there, don't raise your hand, that says, I'm going to escape death. I'm staying here forever, alive. I, I know your body remains will be here, but you're going to be here alive forever. I'm going to do it. You can purpose in your heart to do that. You will not make it. Because we are all, believers are not, headed to an eternity that's not here. Verse 4, isn't this the wonderful thing? When Christ, who is your life, when you are a believer, we look ahead to what? An eternity with him. And that's a wonderful thing to look to. It's a wonderful place that we're going to experience. The full revelation of the glory of Christ and his heaven awaits us who are believers. Uh, and we seek those things, not just when we're having a bad day, but we remind ourselves that our ultimate place in God's eternity is not here. Nobody's ultimate eternal place is here. And for those of us who are living in Christ, our place is with him. And it's a far better place than the terrors and troubles and trials of this world that we live in. It's a life change that's coming for the better if we're in Christ, if we live in Christ. You know, in earthly times, we have a hint of this expectation. Have you ever waited on something and you were expecting something and really, really, really looking forward to it? You know, some of you are looking forward to, I already mentioned it, retirement. The day you can walk out the door and say, I'm never coming back again. And you just, if, if you put in your paperwork and that day has been marked on the calendar and it's within the next 60 days, guess what some people do? They start counting, 58, 57, 56. Oh, they can't wait for that day. And they are anticipating it with, with great optimism and joy to get to that date. Perhaps there's other things you're anticipating like that. Uh, I think you can remember if you're engaged to be married, married and the date is coming on the calendar, you know, uh, one month, one week, count it down. Oh, the wedding is coming. That's for the, those who are getting married, not for the parents who are trying to help put this on. That's for those who are actually doing the uh, I do's. They can't wait and anticipate that that's going to happen. We have anticipation of things. Uh, remember this phrase, and it's the wrong season, but it's like a kid waiting for Christmas. You remember when you have four- and five-year-olds, and it's December 1st, and as soon as you turn that calendar, oh boy, you know, the anticipation is just positively amazing of kids waiting for Christmas. 
We all anticipate things. The greatest anticipation, if you are alive in Christ, is in our eternal place. It's not in something here. And I'm not saying you can't anticipate things here, but with every ounce that we've ever anticipated an earthly event, how much more should we not look above and anticipate a day that we're with our Savior? A day that maybe He appears and we will appear with Him in glory. Or in the absence of that, a day that when this body fails, we will, soul and spirit, be taken from this earthly body that has failed and meet our Savior face to face. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever look to that? Do you ever anticipate that? The passage here says that's the third way, that we should anticipate with joy and give some time to consideration the future we have in Christ and being with Him. So this passage talks about looking up to Jesus with regard to our lives today. What we face today, verse 1. It talks about looking to Jesus with a desire of our affections for spiritual things that are both today and to come in verses 2 and 3. And then in verse 4 it says, look up to Jesus because we're going to spend eternity with Him. And in all those ways, we look above. And in all those ways, we can then answer the question, are you looking above so it's very interesting are you looking above not because an airplane cruises over not to the earthly skies but to the Lord above and how do I measure that there's three ways and we can tell whether we're really looking up or whether we are focused very much here and in the absence of Looking up, our focus becomes just this life. God says, if you're Christian, you're missing something if all your focus is here. Because we've been given the wonderful opportunity for only believers, if we're risen with Christ, to be able to look up. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Help us to be admonished or corrected if need be. Help us to be encouraged if need be to more look up, to look to you, not just for our daily needs, perhaps that's the easiest, but also to set our affection, our heart, our mind, above all the things we love down here, to love you and your things more, and to also look for that wonderful eternity you've promised to all who have placed their faith and trust in Christ and seen their sins forgiven and removed and lives that are made white as snow. May we truly enjoy the benefits and blessings of looking up. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all this week, well, not all this week, but for a while I was trying to pick my closing song. And uh, Val's a little under the weather today. I didn't know that back on Tuesday. And I scoured through these hymnals looking for a song that I thought would go at the end of this message. And I did about 20 minutes of scouring and found nothing close. So then I started looking at these videos we purchased through the uh, uh, COVID time and seeing if there was any that might, you know, seem to be the one to finish with. And I found this one. You see the title of it up there, Sea of Victory. And you say, well, why this? And I, when I played it, it reminded me of when we look up, that's when we see the greatest victories. When we can look not around us, not down here, but we can look up, we see his victory in our daily lives, in our affections, and in a life to come. And I thought, that's the song. Then I found out Val would be best staying home and not playing, and it all worked out. I hate to think if I ever pick another song out of the videos what that means for Val. <laughs> I didn't, no, it doesn't mean anything. But it, God works things out strangely sometimes. And so let's stand together and we'll close with Sea of Victory. If you look up, this is what you'll see in your life too, the victory of Christ living in you and, and immersed through you. It may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. A 
victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord You take what the enemy meant for And you turn it for good You turn it for good just look to the Lord and say, I can't see a way out except for you, Lord, give the victory? That's what looking above is. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the appeal to our hearts and our lives and our affections to look above, to not get so caught up with down and here, uh, earth, earthly things, the trials of this day, the struggles that we face, not to get so tied up with what is truly some days uh, a place without hope that we think we're in the midst of and very close to perhaps without hope. But there's always hope if we look above. The battle's not ours. The, the fight is sometimes not ours. The wisdom to make choices is not ours. Everything that will lead us through is yours. And at the end, the victory we have by looking above, that also is yours. And we thank you for that. We pray that you will bless us this week as we think about looking above. We pray that even now as we take a few moments to share in a lunch together, uh, we ask you to bless this food to our body, nourish and strengthen us. We give thanks for it. We thanks for those who labor to prepare it for us. May you bless their labor in a way that is a, truly a, a great blessing to them. And we'll thank you for them. And we'll thank you again for allowing us this opportunity. And we thank you again for meeting our needs every day of this week as we look above and we look to you, our Savior, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.